Hi, everybody. I'm just going to give a few moments here for people to get into the room before we get started. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Reg Hoyt, and I want to welcome you all to our last One Health seminar of the semester. This is our 12th seminar this academic year, and we're ending it on a really high note. Uh, I'm going to forego some of our slides that we normally would show, but just for those of you who may be new, what is One Health? Well, it's a recognition that we're all sitting on this big blue marble that's on the slide right now, and that we're all engaging with each other, whether it's people with other people or whether it's with the environment, whether it's with plants and animals and vice versa, and that we're all interdependent on each other. Uh, and with that kind of in mind, no matter what your major is, you should be taking that with you down the road and understanding that the problems that are we're faced with, not only at a a local level or regional level or national level or international level, this really requires working together uh, in a transdisciplinary way. You know, for myself, uh, I'm not young, uh, and it took maybe quite a long time in my career before I started realizing that, you know, talking to somebody else who had a totally different point of view moved us a lot further on a problem solution than we might have got there on our own. Uh, and so that's what One Health is all about. And our speaker this evening, uh, I've got to say, is the living embodiment of One Health. And we are incredibly lucky to have him with us tonight. And I'm going to read his introduction directly from the flyer because I don't think we should cut anything out of this. I think that uh, he'll tell you a little bit about his career and his experiences. Uh, but this is, is really going to be a great way to end our One Health seminar series for not only this semester, but for the academic year. Please forgive me for reading, but originally from Canada, now residing in the United Kingdom, George Ledecky, PhD, MED, Diploma, AVES, Honorable, is an education advisor in higher medical and One Health education and global lead, lead of One Hope in association with national, regional, and global organizations. As a former senior lecturer in medical education with the University of Southampton's Faculty of Medicine and, and Consultant Education Advisor with the London KSS Postgraduate Deanery, he was extensively involved in building capacity in undergraduate and postgraduate education and research and interpersonal professional learning, as well as quality assurance and enhancement. More recently, has been engaged in progressing transdisciplinary research in collaboration with the University of Pretoria's Future Africa and the Center for the Study of uh, Res Resilience. As an appraiser and consultant, he also contributed to GIC India's national curriculum Developments with regard to strengthening human and wildlife conflict mitigation through the integration of One Health. Invited as a speaker across global regions, including Africa, Americas, Asia, Europe, and as a workshop facilitator, he has published widely on global sustainability, education transformation, innovation, and leadership, including books on medical education, global population health, and One Health and Well-Being. His most recent articles published in 2022 encompass a three-part article in, entitled Reflections on Transforming Higher Education for the 21st Century, Planet Earth, Averting a Point of No Return, and Planet Sustainability, 
the choice is ours. He contends that the major problems of our time, from climate change to biodiversity loss to inequities and geopolitical conflicts, necessitate a change in our worldview, shifting from a predominant human-centric mindset, it's all about us, to ecocentrism. It's all about species and sustaining our blue planet. With that, I am very pleased to turn over the floor to our speaker tonight, Dr. George Ludecki. Thank you, George. Well, thank you very much, uh, Reg, for this um, wonderful, for this kind introduction. Um, it sort of covers one's life a, a bit, doesn't it? Um, anyway, thank you very much. I, and I, you know, I just, again, thank you for your introduction and the opportunity to present this last session in the series <clears throat> on One Health. Um, yes, the, to, to, to begin with then, um, the, the, the slide that, the, that you're seeing right now, uh, I find it really interesting in other ways than, than the title and so on, because every time I look at that slide, it reminds me very much of how thin our atmosphere is. And, <laughs> and that is quite important really um, in terms of understanding just about contextualizing just about everything I'm going to say, I think, uh, this evening. So advance us now, please, Reg. Will do. Well, I'll try to. Let's see. There we go. Oh, so the, <laughs> thank you very much. So the, the several themes, again, there's not a lot of time today, but there's several themes that I'd like to uh, share with you. Uh, one is reflecting on the big picture as it impacts on each of us, risks, existential risks, um, how, how the One Health concept is evolving and why, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, some several propositions for global sustainability, um, and then to share more information on, of course, on the program or the initiative called One Health for One Planet Initiative. <clears throat> and also to say a few words about the Ecological University, um, along with leaving you with, with a few references. Um, each one of these <laughs> titles, themes, as, as I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll understand why, um, could take easily a week each just to just get into the uh, you know, nuts and bolts of these things. But um, that's the overview, uh, followed by some discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, advance of slide, please. Advance. Yes, so the, the first thing then is putting things in perspective. I think we're living in a very, well, complex, anxiety producing, uncertain age. Um, and it's very easily done that we forget um, where things sit in terms of our own evolution uh, of the planet and uh, of the animals on the planet and in relation to where we are today and the future. Next slide, please. So this particular slide uh, summary, um, you can get the first title up, is about the Earth evolution. And it's a summary really, very quickly, no time to spend. We don't have time to spend on each of these, but we just keep on going down. I'll just go back there, Reg. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, generally speaking, I think people agree we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our universe started 13.7 billion years ago. Um, our Earth, maybe 4.5 billion years ago. Um, organisms, maybe 3.8 billion years ago. Multicellular uh, cellular life, 2.8. Um, first animals, 575 million years ago. Dinosaurs, 243 million years ago. Mammals, about 210. Early human species, maybe 2.5 million years ago. And modern humans, us, we came along, give or take, um, a version of us, ourselves, maybe 200 years, 1,000 years ago. Um, then the, uh, the human homo, homo sapiens actually went through several uh, revolutions which shaped our, our lives and, our, and who we are and in the course of history, actually. Um, so the, moving on then, so the, okay. 
so on 70,000 years ago, um, something called the cognitive revolution, imagination, was uh, more or less came into being. 12,000 years ago, um, agricultural revolution. Um, there were maybe only 4 million people on the planet. Um, 500 years ago, scientific revolution, maybe 60 million people on the planet. Um, 80 years ago, I used to be with a medical school here in Southampton, 80 years ago, I used to tell my students, uh, you know, uh, when they first uh, antibiotic came in, they must they all basically said in the beginning of their uh, courses, maybe, oh, two or 300 years ago. But then, of course, I had to correct them in 1935. Before that, we really couldn't deal with, address any infections. Two billion people. Um, and then the next one, of course, we're now currently in the digital information revolution age. There may be a better title for this, but that's certainly moving things along very quickly, accelerating our lives very quickly. That's only 30 years ago. And then the next one coming through. Now, today, we have 8 billion people. Oops, go back a bit, maybe. <laughs> 8 billion people, um, maybe 8.5 million species. And there's no doubt, unquestionably, there's no doubt about the fact that we are facing our own survival. And I think the point of this particular slide is that it's taken us 4.5 billion years to where we are, but in just a few 30, 40 years, we could be undoing all the progress. In the last four or five decades, we've, we've been undoing the progress that we've made and are actually accelerating the decline, uh, our decline. Next slide, please. There are a number of global risks that we face. I know this is um, always difficult to talk about this and not to give it enough time, but I uh, made a list of some of them uh, on this next slide. Um, and yes, just to say that, yes, before we, yeah, <laughs> getting there. Yes, before, uh, speaking about the global risks, um, something that is really, I think, causing a lot of concern for all of us and across all the countries in the world, really, um, and you know, it's really the society that we've produced today. Um, we seem to be in a grip of tribalism, you uh, or win and lose, really, situation. And we were, we've developed a culture of them and us. And as Ephraim Mervis said, Chief Rabbi here in the UK, when, when we look upon others, we fail to see their humanity. And I think that's a major issue um, because we all, in the final analysis, all human, and we live with other species. Um, and that's and, and why we fail, why we forget to, to see our own humanity in others is, is um, a subject of a lot of discussion that, that we should be having. Next slide, please. So here then are some of the global risks. I can't see them all right now. This particular slide is coming on slowly. Okay, so climate change is our biggest risk. Um, emerging infectious diseases, um, COVID-19, and who knows what uh, is gonna happen in the future the Russia-Ukraine war, artificial intelligence, um, in particular in the, you know, with the chat, chatbot, the, 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 the newer artificial models that are coming out, um, food security or insecurity, the whole area of the threats of viral uh, outbreaks are growing very quickly. We know how, uh, how much the um, global pandemic, COVID-19 has cost us. Uh, it was estimated, for example, in 2013, that it would cost about $5 billion um, well, actually, uh, to, to, to cope or to address a pandemic of that, of that size. But actually, we have spent, the, the world has spent about, um, give or take, $18 trillion um, in economic terms. $18 trillion, which is a lot of money. Uh, we're also facing species decline. Um, and, and, and this slide here, uh, is, is showing some elephants, for example. In Africa, there were 1.5 billion million elef elephants not very long ago at all, uh, three, four years ago. 
And currently there are only 400,000 elephants remaining. And as these other species, vertebrates, birds, animals, and, 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 and so on, as they decline, we are losing, we are losing actually the very, uh, the, the gas in the, in the, on the planet that makes us all uh, survive, to live. The more we lose, for example, in South America and the Caribbean, the loss, species loss since 1970 is 94% of all species. Globally, worldwide, it's 68% loss. Now what happens if these numbers are pushed as they are, as is happening now, you know, even further, 6% in South America, that's 100% decline in a period of uh, decades. Um, the other area that I think is very important, and again, not enough time to discuss this, but is the uh, risk is the, the, the loss of democracy. Um, again, it's a very small, slide that you're seeing there. But basically what it's saying there, the dark, dark blue, the dark blue that you can see there, Australia, Canada, and, and uh, Nordic countries are in, in all comprise about 7% uh, of countries that have full de democracy, only 7% have full democracy. Um, and that has major impacts on uh, our future. There's no doubt about that. Fundamentally, the big issue across the planet then is poverty um, and inequality. And it's interesting that, um, to me it's very interesting that um, uh, the, the cartoon there is showing that there's some of us who are very lucky sitting at the one end of the boat uh, while people are bailing water very quickly and the boat are sinking for, for everyone. Just a thought. Okay, next slide please. Yes, so to put things in perspective again, we, I mean the planet, we spend all the countries about $2.1 trillion on war per year. Now, one trillion is a million million. That's a lot. Out of about 95 trillion GDP globally. And the United Nations receives only 6 billion for peace. It's a thought. And conflicts, the war or conflicts are really, according to Colonel Ron Guerin here, listed here, cited here, are really the greatest failure of humanity. There's no doubt about that. And it's 2023 and, you know, it's just not easing up. And that's really an issue, a big issue for the younger generation, but all, for all of us. Next slide, please. So the world has been trying to do stuff, you know, things about, um, responding to some of these issues through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with them. Um, we've got some information coming on the side. Just keep on going, uh, Reg. So there are 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. They were adopted by 193 countries. They signed, the people of these countries have signed up to these. Um, on 25th of September, 2015, and there are 17 SDGs, 169 targets um, and indicators, but this, there's been a very, very slow uptake, a major reversing um, because of COVID-19 and, and other reasons, to the point that only 12% right now, as we speak, of the 140 targets are currently on track. And you've got to say, and I guess the United Nations, is, um, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, people there are also saying, uh, why is this so? Why are we not meeting targets? And that in itself is, you know, fruit for much discussion. Next slide, please. And, and it's so become so important uh, to, to have moved these along, because when you consider the, the essence of the SDGs, they are all interrelated. They are not fragmented. So when we're speaking about uh, life on earth, uh, life on land, life on the, you know, uh, or any of these energy, employment, education, or any of the SDGs, they're all interconnected. And we cannot speak of one without impacting another and so on and so forth. The world is interconnected. It used to be much more linear. There's no doubt in people's minds at least. 
but now it's totally interconnected. What happens in Africa, as we now know with Ebola and so on and so forth, uh, will impact, could impact us, including what happened um, with uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what's happening, this is very, uh, this is brand new actually, very interesting information for me as well. I wasn't really following this as much. Um, is that the United Nations Secretary General, because the uptake and the results so far with the SDGs are so low, they are, they are developing, hoping to develop a rescue plan for the earth, really, for people and the planet. We're, we're, they've reached about the United Nations and, and the countries have reached about the midpoint of their developments towards to, to 2030. And the SDGs are, as I said, already off track, many of them. And they're looking at ways of rescuing the SDG initiative. And, in direct, and, and I suppose directly, therefore, I, I would assume, I, 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 in my thinking, they would also uh, help to rescue planet Earth and us, because that's what they're all about. Um, so this slide here also has, you can see at the bottom there, the, an interim progress report. If you have a moment to, you know, in the next few days or weeks to look at that, it's really interesting what they're, how they're going to do this and maybe how you can get involved as well. Next slide, please. Things are serious. Um, this is something that, <clears throat> that a lot of people, um, if you can go on with a few more. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think this is really uh, fundamentally important. And basically what this slide is saying is that we used to think, or we do think, some of us and politicians and scientists and myself, I guess to some extent, um, for, for sure, um, we think that politicians are in charge or economists are in charge or scientists are in charge of our planet. But what, uh, what, uh, what COVID-19 has really taught, taught us, wait, the wake up call is really, no, we're not no longer in charge of our um, planet. It's actually the biosphere. It is a biosphere that is now in charge. That means uh, in charge of um, society, economy, and so on, um, which changes things. Because without the biosphere, none of these, not, none of no life would exist. First of all, and secondly, um, and secondly, there's very little we can do at this point in time. Simply because reversing the biosphere at this point in time. It's almost too late, as, as you probably can gather, given the carbon dioxide and, and, and uh, uh, methane gas and nitrous oxide and so on and so forth in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. And of course, this is where the SDGs come in. And, and this is also one of the reasons why the whole notion, the concept of circular economy, uh, you know, no waste, eliminate waste, and so on, that becomes so, so important. So if you look at the picture on the left, if you look at the, the beautiful landscape there, and you look at the picture on the left, you can see the part of the problem uh, that we're facing, um, pollution um, in many in major cities, um, and so on and so forth. And there is definitely an urgent need to re reorient our thinking towards a sustainable future. There's no doubt about that. How far, how many more cars could fit in there? That's in uh, Delhi, New Delhi, but there are many, many other cities like that. Next slide, please. So this is where the One Health and Wellbeing concept comes in. I'm sure you're very familiar with it already. Next slide, please. So, uh, and then how it's evolving. Just keep on down, yeah. So the, as you all know, as we know, you know, as they say, One Health is really not a new concept, goes right back to Hippocrates in the fifth century uh, BCE, before the current era, and so on and so forth, with, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's the first time that human, that civilization has had to face the issues that we're facing. And we're recognizing fully the interdependence, the linkage, interconnectedness of us, animals, and plants. And so saying to somebody the other day, you know, we can take humans out of the equation and this, our planet will thrive. But we take animals out or ant plants or taking out our environment, 
it will surely perish. There's no doubt about that. So that to me is really the nuts and bolts of, um, of the One Health concept, why it's so, so critical. So that also means that it needs a new, we need a new societal narrative. And, and uh, you know, across the socioeconomic, political, environmental landscapes. You have to start talking differently. Because I think this is something that the your, your university is very much ahead of the game, really. Um, DVU uh, is, and that's really saying it, 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 it engages, involves all sectors of society, One Health does, and all disciplines. And it, it, and, and it engenders, encourages collaboration, finding out what the root causes really are, prevention, and building capacity. And it's been taken on board by major organizations too numerous to mention here, that's for sure. But you know, World Bank, is, as an example, has taken on the uh, triad, which I know is very good um, in, um, at DVU as well. I really do must say, Reg, that I really do like the definition that you have for One Health, which I think is superb. It really is. Anyway, moving on, next one. It's also, okay, I was just going to say G, the G7, group of seven countries, major countries, the rich countries, G20, which includes China, Russia, and, not, and some of the other countries, have also uh, endorsed, in principle, not in practice necessarily, the One Health concept. Okay, so what it does lead us down to is really the need to transform our worldview, a new narrative. Next slide, please. And yeah, we're getting there. A few years ago, I actually, okay. Hmm. And that's really our greatest challenge. Um, I'm not too sure, there's a lot of discussion now about a lot of things, crisis coming up and so on and so forth. And I'm not too sure um, how, can we, how we can weave this world together. You know, you've got Russia, you've got China, you've got United States, you've got North Korea, you had the United Kingdom, you've got all these different countries um, sort of at odds at each, with each other right now uh, in different ways. And you start thinking, hey, listen, wait a minute. All the things that we're worried about, that we're concerned about, take a look at the big picture. Take a look at our planet, how small it is in relation to all the other planets and what have you. Take a look at the issues that we have created. These are the issues we have created. And what we do need is, a, is to find a unity around a common cause. That's what all the governments, I think, need to do. That's what the United Nations needs to do. And it's a matter of transforming our worldview. Not easily done, for sure, but I don't think we have a choice anymore. That's our belief systems, the things that we, that we value, our mental models. And we definitely have no choice but to rise above the divisions as I was just saying, that we have created. You know, we, 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 we agonize over far left, far right, republic, democrat, and so on and so forth. We have all of these different labels, but you start thinking, well, do, do any of these labels really mean anything to when the world is at high risk? And to me, one of the biggest problems has been and continues to be in politics and in universities as well and so on. I'm not being critical, but really our whole focus has been on us, human centrism. All the books basically, most of the books written ever have been about us. And they've really, not until recently, maybe 1950s, I don't know, maybe before a bit, but you know, we have bothered very little about other species, the health and welfare of other species, the well-being of other species. And we let that slide tremendously. Until the, it's you no, know, it's backfiring, hasn't it? So, if there is one cause around which all governments, including the United Nations and other governments, need to start thinking more about, is how do they, how can we ensure the needs, our needs, are compatible with the needs of our ecosystems? And I think that's the key, really. That is the key. How do you then, the question of course is, uh, how do you convince those people who don't, believe, who don't have time for this type of thinking? 
Well, I think, I'm not sure. I think probably at election time, and there are a lot of countries where you don't have elections, so I don't know how you do it there uh, as much, but it's really sending a message to politicians, I think was probably the first, the most, one of the most important um, messages. Because the scientists, the IPCC at the United Nations and so on, the climate, climate change people, they are very much on side. They're 100% concerned as well. But their messages sometimes are not getting through because politicians very often have to think or do think short term, how do I get elected again and so on and so forth. And I think we've got to get away from that. That's a luxury for another time. Next slide, please. So in the book that you see there, um, written about two, three years ago, there are 10, don't, I'm not gonna bore you with all these, but 10 propositions for global sustainability. And what I had in mind there is really to um, talk about technology, talk about you know, nature, the importance of nature, we are all part of nature, and talk about education and so on, and learning and so on. And proposition seven is, I think, key, because it says, it says basically, that the unifying one health and one well-being concept should become or could become the cornerstone of our education systems and societal institutions. Because it seems to me that every institution, every institution and certainly education institutions, we need to engage the younger people and all uh, learners, adult learners and so on, in the process of re, uh, you know, raising awareness of what of what we need to do individually and collectively to make sure that we get out of the mess that we've created. Next slide, please. So it's about learning for sustainability. Next slide, please. And this is where the One Health and Wellbeing Concept uh, Initiative comes in. <clears throat> So the, the idea is, the main aim is to mobilize society. That's a very ambitious, um, I, I realize, it's a very ambitious uh, aim, very hard to move, to move things along, especially in the context in which we're living, but to mobilize society to adopt the One Health and Wellbeing concept. Now, I prefer, uh, you don't have to, of course, uh, I have added the term well-being to One Health. Because if basically, in a, you know, when I've gone to speaking at different in different places, and so on, you say, "What does you are start by saying, you know, what does one health mean to you?" And the people usually say, "Well, it's yeah, you know, I understand one health. It's about physical health, your mental health, and so on, and so on." But when you start thinking, it's beyond that. It's a well-being of not only us, but all other species, and the well-being, it's like, you know, of other species is equally important. And it's about the. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, to, which is really about the strategy to get us there, to get us to a point where we have, you know, have saved the planet, actually, saved ourselves. And next a few words there, um, Brett. So underpinning, again, no time for this, but underpinning the concept, One Health and Wellbeing concept, or just use the word One Health if you want, are a number of um, values and principles. For example, the first one and, and the sources are behind that. Have a look if you have a chance sometime. You know, the, inter, the, the interdependence of our life. We talked about that. There's the Earth Charter, which I wish we had more time to talk about, which came out um, in the early 2000, um, actually 1996, actually, um, which I think is very important, which is the showing compassion for the sanctity of our life. And I know that DVU is very much involved with animal health and so on. But it's really the Earth Charter and the principles are really supporting DVU and other organizations and other institutions. It's about the compassion for the re sanctity of our life. And then the United Nations SDGs, which argue for a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. And finally, just last December, the One Health High Level Expert Panel, United Nations, and so on, um, are arguing for you know, a very good definition as well, multiple sectors, disciplines, and, com and communities at varying levels of, of society uh, working towards uh, the One Health concept. Next slide, please. So it's about act cultivating an active care for the world and for us with whom we share it. So the One Health, um, One Hope is a short form for it. 
uh, the idea is really to engage groups, planners um, in six regions of the, of, the, of, the, of the planet. That's the Americas, that's Europe, that's um, Africa, that's um, Asia, Southeast Asia, and um, Oceania, which, uh, Australia, and the Pacific Islands, and New Zealand. And to, yes, well, next slide, please. So the idea that what we're doing right now and have been doing for several years, it's been very tough because of the pandemic and so many other things happening in the world, is, uh, is engaging in consultations um, with each of the, in, across these regions. Um, the building, with a view to building regional consortia of universities led by universities. Uh, and working groups um, towards the towards meeting the aim of the of one hope, raising awareness, regional partners, sustainable development goal priorities, um, learning opportunities for people, uh, public policy, transdisciplinary research, funding of course is very important, um, and eventually to uh, establish an international advisory forum. So that's sort of the gist of it, of what we're trying to do. So 2022, 2024, we're looking for um, universities in these, uh, across some of these regions, as, as we're speaking actually, as we're speaking in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, different places um, in India, um, who would like to get involved in discussing how we could might move the One Hope concept, One Hope initiative ahead. So we're open-minded. If DVU wants DVU, <laughs> DVU wants to get involved, um, by all means, do so. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, <clears throat> so the capacity development for sustainable future, and this is very much related to education and research. Where I think again, who am I? But you know, where my thoughts have taken me over the years. Um, if one were to ask me, for example, how would you see education change this century or in the next ten years or so? I would say, well, I would like to see education all levels shifting from. I'm saying many of these universities are already doing that, and schools and high schools and so on, from knowledge fragmentation to integrative learning across discipline. I was really pleased to hear Reg talk about experiential learning and the importance of that, absolutely. But you know, by and large, if I, go, if I look at the curriculum here in the United Kingdom, where, where I reside now, or in Canada and wherever, you know, we're still fragmenting a lot of things. You know, it's math and you have to, students, this is math, this is geography, this is history, blah, 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 blah. Well, the world is no longer fragmentation. We can't fragment it like that anymore. We've got to interrelate somehow, integrative learning. In terms of research, it's the same thing to a large extent. We need to pay equal attention. I think there's the biggest change though, to health of ecosystems, animals, and humans. And that's equal attention, not only theoretically or in knowledge base, but in funding. You know, again, the United Nations gets 6 billion for peace. Uh, animal health gets about 3 million. And, um, you know, and so on and so forth, the, 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 the money is not there. The other thing that I think is very, very important uh, in moving the, these types of ideas ahead is different, uh, is maybe again, DVU is probably doing this, but is community engagement. If move, you know, moving the larger, especially not larger and smaller and medium-sized university thinking into the communities in a way that the communities will understand much better so it's from move, moving from the institutional traditional to actually communicating with the communities. And this leads me to the next slide, almost the last slide, leads me to the next slide, which is really the idea of a new type of university, the ecological university, which basically begins, sets this, you know, the basic foundation is really the one health and well-being concept which cuts across plants, animals, and so on, as you know. The Earth Charter, which we don't have time for today, but also does the same thing, but it, um, 
it really develops the idea of respect and care for the community of life, much more so than some of these other um, theoretical orientations. And of course, the sustainable development goals to take strategies uh, uh, ahead, integrating them across disciplines um, uh, within the universities, and then building essentially the idea of the ecological university by, you know, by, by common themes across subjects and so on and so forth. And eventually leading to the, to a transformative, uh, evolving a mission uh, within the university structures that is very much transformative. And what is interesting, if you, when I was going through this a few years ago, no, last year, I guess, um, looking at the various key phrases that, that come out of the uh, descriptions, um, I was presently encouraged by the fact that all of these different conceptualizations actually have a lot in common and could provide a unity of purpose to universities, regardless of what is taught, where it's taught, how it's taught. But somehow this type of thinking must be, should be brought into the minds and hearts of staff, of students, of the community. There's a, there's a chapter, chapter I wrote some time ago about the ecological university and so on and so forth in this particular book here. It's a, an edited book. Next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of making change, and I'm just doing an uh, article on this right now, actually. Um, I'll just go back for that. Yes, I think the United Nations is still very much the only organization on the planet that can make these changes across the, you know, across the uh, various countries, regardless of the differences. And one of the things that I, I would like to suggest to some people is that the United Nations consider the establishment of, for example, a One Health and Wellbeing Sus Sustainability Council. But that's really what we're up against right now. Um, where the United Nations Security Council, which is made up of five countries, France, Britain, Russia, China, uh, excuse me, uh, the United States, um, is made up of five permanent members, five permanent members established in 1946, that group, not the same people, of course, today, 1946, these are the victors of the Second World War, who are, those, those five groups that I just mentioned are still running the show globally. So, although since 1946, India is now 1.4 billion people, um, uh, Africa 1.3 billion people, and so on and so forth, these countries, huge countries, population-wise, uh, are not included in the United Nations Security Council. And that's got to be a problem. That is an issue, a reform issue. And I think a council like this, or whatever it's called, could really help to balance what is missing right now. In particular, in particular, I, I, I strongly, strongly encourage youth delegations. It is the youth of our planet who have the most to lose and also the most to gain by being directly involved in the decisions that are being made on their behalf, our behalf today. And they're lacking in, I think they're absent from many of the key decision-making bodies. And I think the United Nations should set the pace here, should really you know, become the model across the globe for youth involvement, engagement at that level, and not just as tokens and so on, but as you know, directly involved in decision makers and to put the brakes on, to put the brakes on and uh, where it need, which needed. Because the vetoes that, you know, that occur in the United Nations Security Council usually come from two sides, and I think you know which two sides I'm talking about, and they've prevented a lot of excellent progress that should be made and lives that could be saved, must be saved. And a council like this could balance that. But I'm not sure whether that makes a lot of difference to people in the United Nations right now, but I think that's something that really must, needs to be looked at. Next slide, please. Almost finished, yeah, yes. So here's what... <laughs> You know, I don't want to bore you with this, but this is my own personal journey on this one life scenario. I come from Canada. I did some research with the indigenous Cree in Ontario and so on. 
did a lot of work in higher education, in, including in the United States, came to the United Kingdom, worked in the Faculty of Medicine, and so on and so forth. And this was my first book, um, where it was very interdisciplinary oriented. That led me to public health, multidisciplinary oriented, actually a very thick book, actually, which led me to this book here on survival and health and plans and future. Um, and this chapter in here about the transprisonary research, really, which is in, in this uh, particular book here. Next slide, please. So recent articles. <laughs> Reg, thank you very much for mentioning these already, but these are all online pretty well. There's uh, just, you know, the first one, I'm not going to read them out now, the second one. Um, and there's one coming out in May, which is called Time for Planet Reset. I really think, <laughs> I'm sorry to say it this way, but I really think, given the times we're experiencing right now, that really we don't have a heck of a lot of time to lose for decision makers. And I'm talking about both sides of communism and autocracies and what have you, to get together and to say, how can we continue like this? We can't continue like this. What do we need to do to reset it? And what kind of future? I think that's the key question. What kind of future do we, the civilization, do we want? And who's going to guide us to that future? I think we have to have a very open discussion at the highest levels to deal with that. And the other, you know, other articles written uh, earlier um, in 2022, if you have time, these are all online again. These are short articles on, on health, short articles on the change, the, the world will you change the narrative, and then the international, the one hope concept. Next slide, please. That's my last slide. I'm <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm quoting Charles Darwin here. You probably have read what he said, but I think he's absolutely right. A long history of humankind that those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. So I thank you very much. And I hope we have some time, a few bit of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, George. And we do have one question that's coming in. And I certainly encourage all of you to put your questions in the Q&A. We have a few minutes left. Uh, first, this is from Kelly. Do you have any advice how we can start to implement sustainability within our homes and our individual lives? That's a very good question. I think it comes right down to the local level. Um, I think I think the first step really is to think more clearly about what we do on a week to week, day to day basis. How can we do something about the energy crisis? And I think that's a good example. Maybe you know the cost of gasoline, diesel, and so on, fuel is is very high. And I think the the, the, the issue there, of course, is that um, do we always have to use a car? Is there not public transport? Is there not different ways? I think it really, you know, what, what if, if, it depends on what you do in your life too. If you're a student and you you care as you as Kelly probably does uh, as much as she does about the future of the planet and about the current situation in the community, uh, getting together with some friends, for example, and saying, is there anything that we can do online as a, as a start to raise awareness? Of the, along the lines, I suppose, uh, without intimidation, but what's really happening in our communities? How are we spending our money? And how can we save money? And, and so it's, it's a matter of uh, being a seeds carrier, carrying seeds to different, to peoples as much as we can about how to, how to um, live life differently. I was recently in Singapore, as an example, and I was really struck by several signs that caught my attention. But one of them that did is, one of the signs that I saw was in a, in a shop window, and it was basically saying, along the lines of, remember, just buy enough food for what you need, for not what you don't need, something like that. I mean, these are small tips, little messages. Um, I think, I think eventually, I think, our, our, you know, this is, this is another kind of worm, but certainly our diets are a key part of, of, of the future. 
our diets, um, and how how can we how can we um, help the planet in terms of um, uh, you know in in, ter in terms of um, shifting our diets towards um, keeping what we've got that we really enjoy, but also keeping uh, you know uh, looking at different options, uh, plant based diets and so on and so forth. But it's really up to individuals to sit down, talk things through, have a dialogue with each other and say, what can we do at our level in our community uh, to raise awareness uh, in terms of uh, how we can you know, um, create space and create a more uh, society that's workable? That, 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 yeah, thank you. So from anonymous, we have, uh, how can we go about having conversations, discussions with people claiming that climate change is a conspiracy and fake? Well, so, yeah, that's, <laughs> I think, I think people are more than likely detest people who come and say, this is what I think and what you think, it doesn't matter. I think you've got, we have to meet people at the level, if you will, that they're at, not that the level we wish they were at. So how do you, how do you deal with someone who feels it's a conspiracy? Then who, you know, and you can get into also the political arguments and so on and so forth uh, to convince other people, persuade them that it's not a conspiracy, it's real. I suppose the best way is through some evidence, some evidence, evidence, which is, I mean, you don't have to, in the United States, we don't, uh, in the United States and different parts of the world, we do not have to look far about seeing a shift in the serious, in, in, in the um, intensity of storms, of tornadoes and the damage and so on. We don't have to look far, or maybe we do, so we, we, we need to raise awareness uh, with each other as what's happening in, in um, Ethiopia, Somalia, in the African countries. I think examples um, and, a, and a discussion, a dialogue uh, where, I mean, who, who conspires? The question is who conspires in the first place and why do they do that? So, you know, and I think, uh, social media has a lot to do with that. Media has a lot to do with that. Um, uh, I think the 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 um, movie uh, "Don't Look Up," which you may have seen, um, you know, um, you know DiCaprio and so on, um, the is is really worthwhile watching. In fact, the one of the articles that um, that I wrote um, not too long ago is uh, started with that particular movie, uh, a segment of that movie. Um, and 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 uh, at the end, the last scene of the movie was, I think, you know, DiCaprio sitting around the table, and they caught the um, asteroid is coming towards Earth, going to annihilate everyone, and everyone knows what's going to happen in the movie, of course. Um, um, and and you know, DiCaprio said something like, "You know what? You know what? We really did have it all, didn't we?" And I think, I think that is sort of an emotional contact there. We did really have it all, but look what we're losing now. Look at the species that I was talking about. 94% of all vertebrate animals and so on and so forth, fish and so on, decline, lost since 1970. Where's it coming from? Um, what does that mean? And, and it goes on and on. The, 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 the fact is, the fact is that we can prove that the we're shooting about 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the air every year, 36 billion tons. And we know for a fact, this is not a conspiracy, we know for a fact that this carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere um, for thousands, thousands of years or more. So what happens when it's 60, 000, 60 billion tons? And we're moving that way. So I think there's, how do you convince people the facts? Uh, listen to the facts, see what they say about the facts, the evidence that's there, and 
you know, there are some people that are, are bound to say that for different reasons, but let's hope out of 10, uh, four might be conspiracy, you know, might, might find conspiracy theories are attractive. Let's hope six of the, uh, <laughs> the majority doesn't, you know, yeah. From John, we have the question, in relation to curtailing pollution, what is your opinion on electric cars versus hybrid cars? Well, I don't pretend to be a, an expert in this. Um, I think, I think that by hybrid, you mean basically electric and gasoline, fossil fuel, and so on and so forth. Well, I think we need to definitely move much more quickly towards alternatives to fossil fuel um, for using using gas or diesel or whatever uh, in, in in our in all of our uh, cars. I think currently, I, I, my own view on that is that currently the prediction is uh, the the. I guess the recommendation is that by 2040, uh, we would get rid of fossil fuels for cars. There's even 2050, I think, just judging by what the IPCC is saying and so on, I think 2040 is too late. It is too late. You saw that picture maybe, yeah. you know, in New Delhi, the cars and so on. Well, that's, it's not only what, it's, it's what pollution is doing right now. We're losing about 7 million people per year because of pollution, young children in Africa and so on, and in India and so on. And I, so electric cars, yes, I think, I, I do think that solar energy is probably the longer term way to go anyway. Electricity is also um, the next step for sure, next stage. But I think eventually, I think solar energy uh, will be um, hydrogen energy and so on. I think will probably be, become the more affordable uh, alternative. I'd like to wrap us up this evening okay. with a question of my own. Uh, first, I'd like to start out with saying, George, uh, in your career, in all of your writings, I'd like to say that you've had a major impact on me. Uh, and I've read several of, of your, your articles and books, and uh, that has certainly helped to formulate my ideas about One Health and bring together my experiences into something that's a bit more focused and, and the recognition of bringing everyone into the fold of, of One Health or One Hope, uh, and that, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question looking at the, you know, in the past, we were able to address CFCs on a global level. We, we as people everywhere, we recognized the damage and the, the risk that we were facing from continuing as same as usual. And we did something. Uh, it seems to me that we're faced with even greater challenges now where we're sitting on the precipice of a number of planetary boundaries. We don't know when we will see the collapse of any number of systems. Uh, I would argue that, you know, looking at the needs of people should include the needs of ecosystems. I would say the needs of the ecosystem is our only hope <laughs> if we don't address the needs of the ecosystem uh we ourselves will not survive either so that that question of what it is that's going to bring us all together it seems to me that the ipcc's report the latest report they are getting very very upset with the lack of action uh you know you were talking about the emergency plan for the planet uh what do you think is going to be the tipping point for action well i think the um 
fundamentally. That was a pretty simple question to ask, wasn't it? For yeah, <laughs> they're not. It's easily done. But, but you're saying something very important, the tipping point. We are, and I don't want to, you know, the, 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 the problem is I know many of your people uh, attending perhaps are um, <clears throat> want a life that's happy, cheerful, optimism, and so on. And so do I. You know, I have a big family and so on. I want my children and so on and so forth to be the same. I don't want to be the same. Um, by the same talk, by the same, but because of these books I've written and this and this and this and countries I've gone to, I have not become a pessimist by any means. I've become more cautious about my optimism, that's for sure. However, having said that, I must conclude, as I'm speaking to you right now and to, to some of the folks there, that we, that this planet and us, we are, we are to blame, human beings. We have a global, we have global system failure. The systems are not working. Even, um, well, take any system. I mean, in the United Kingdom right now, and I'm not in the United Kingdom, our parliamentary system is not working as well. In the United States, it's not working as well. As well. So the systems, generally speaking, are not working. The climate systems are not working the way they should. We shouldn't have as much pollution and so on. The Zelensky, the um, president of the Ukraine, said it really well. On February the 24th, 2020, Two, he said, how is it that everything that we've experienced, wars, um, are repeating themselves again, once again, in 2022? How is it that we're allowing that? And how is it, and this is my own personal view, and it's in my articles too, because I was thinking about that as well. How is it that so few people on this planet can take me hostage and you hostage from our future? How, do, how is it that, this, that a system allows that? How is it that the United Nations, President of the United Nations Home, Sec, Home Sec, uh, United Nations Security Council last month, right, for the month was directly from Russia. He was a president for a month, which is fine. But somehow, where are the, where are the checks and balances here? And you know, Zelensky is uh, the president of Ukraine is absolutely right. How is it that's possible? Where is the failure here? Where's the failure assistance? And climate change is so important. And I, I'm thinking, you know, COP, I'm not sure of how uh, um, much time you've given to any of this, but COP26, I was there in Glasgow, COP27, I wasn't there, but I listened very earnestly. There were 45,000 people who attended COP27 in Egypt. Um, how is it that after two weeks, after two weeks of 45,000 people attending and many lobbyists and many governments there, Arab Republic and all the UAE and all this, how is it that on the last day, the last few minutes, three countries, I'm not going to mention them now, but three countries took out a big sentence in the document that was finally released saying they, we do not support the elimination of fossil fuels. Not now or maybe never. How is it? So the systems are really not working too well. And I'm thinking now, as you're saying, what will change the system? Well, I think first off, without getting into details now, but is the United Nations Security Council has to change, number one. Number two, number two, we've got to get social media in the United States, all over the world really, in the democratic countries, especially, uh, involved much more in a in a trust trust relationship. You know, I'm again getting specifics here. We've got to get teachers in schools, academics in universities, give them a forum to talk, to discuss much more, to create awareness, and and the more I think of it, you know. Uh, if you think back a thousand years or more, at least to the 12th century, when the first universities, Cambridge, Oxford, Bologna came to be, um, the rise of the, 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 the 
capacity of the universities to lead society out of misery has not always, but has been excellent over the, if you look at the overall things, you know, whether it's, you know, going from the ancient Greeks to more modern thinking in the 13th, 14th century to, you know, to today, scientific thought and so on and so forth. Well, now we do need the universities. There are 28,000, I'm gonna go back up a bit. There are over 300 million students in universities right now, over 300 million. There are about 15,000 universities on the planet. There are about 17,000 academics. I think that capacity building, that if people there working closely with the United Nations, for example, together could lead us out of the mess to a large extent that we're in. There's no other organization right now except the university system, which has this global outreach, which has the passion, the research capacity, and the young people to move us ahead. I think that talk about a movement, it's not just the one health concept, it's a movement like the young people at DVU and others to say, yes, this is important. We're gonna take One Health forward and make people aware that, yes, <laughs> yes, um, this planet will not, will be okay without us, but we can continue to mess it up. And I think it's the younger voice that we like to hear on radio, on TV, and so on and so forth, podcasts and so on. Um, so it's system failure, it's system failure. And I think um, the examples, computers, uh, high technology, uh, no, um, artificial intelligence, another example of potential system failure. We know, I don't know how many of your students have read this or you've read this, um, but you know, <clears throat> Yuval Harari, he wrote The Sapiens, he wrote Homo Deus, um, and he wrote, um, Homo Deus, and in Homo Deus, he's a, he's a professor from uh, Israel, University of Israel, um, and, and, and a very clever thinker, a very clear thinker. He understands a lot uh, of what many of us don't, don't understand. I think. But one of the things that he did say, he said, you know, with, the, with um, artificial intelligence and, and um, technology, his question was, Will, it, will we not see the day, will we not come to a day when um, we create such capacity for robots and artificial intelligence and so on, where the robots will eventually say, hey, listen, do we really need these humans? Because it's already happening with chat, you know, chat, GBT, and so on. It's already, it's there. Then we have all these Google and so on and so on saying, yes, we're very concerned about this and so on and so forth. And two months later, Elon Musk says, I'm in it. I'm in the game now. I'm playing it uh, as well. So I, we, and it seems to me there's a system there that, uh, you know, that Harari talks about that is gradually nurturing us to adopt, adopt technology and we're going to lose potentially creativity. I see it, I see it in my own family. Uh, you know, with the use of mobile phones and so on. I can see, I can see the, 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 the individuals and young people um, being taken over. We're take, being taken, I'm being taken over by this technology bit. And it's not so, no, not so much, you know, what do you think about? It's about yes or no. What do you think? Yes, I don't know. It's about the way the computers work, you know. So I think, and then, of course, the school systems, and I'm, I'm getting off time, time just a bit, but the school systems in the UK have ditched to a large extent the humanities, music, art, and then so on, animals, um, understanding of what this world, and ditch that and replace it with extra classes in com computer technology and, and what have you. Sports. Down. I mean, so these are the very things that make us human. And I think, again, this, these types of things have to be discussed, dialogue and so on. And people have to be very honest about how they really feel. Um, the answer is not only technology, it's part of the answer, but certainly 
So it's about fixing systems. Now that your question is right on, how do we do? I think we have to raise awareness, uh, Raj, you know, and, and listen to others, uh, write articles, you know. I'm, the main reason I write these articles is because there's something inside me that has been saying, I'm not happy with some of the things I'm feeling and seeing and what can I think about and what can I share? That's really how I'm doing it. It's not, it's not for any other reason. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> well, we're sure glad that you're doing it. And Dr. Ludecki, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, I would say to our audience, uh, we're coming up at the end of the semester. I know you've got lots of things to be thinking about. Our members of the community are probably looking forward to your summer as well. But I would say, you know, we're all looking at a future that uh, at the moment where we've got a lot of challenges. Uh, I hope that you will take some of the things that we've talked about tonight. You'll take it forward. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Uh, you know, it's voices from you, from all of us, that maybe will make a difference in these systems. And that's what we need. We need to be looking towards the future uh, and make it a hopeful one, perhaps Absolutely. through one hope. <laughs> Dr. Ledecky, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for coming tonight. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you very much, Raj. It was a pleasure and the opportunity to talk. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for uh, coming to us all the way from the UK. I know it's getting late for you. Uh, and uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>